Hello, and thank you for tuning in. Today, I'm going to talk about building React Native applications using GraphQL. More specifically, I'm going to talk about my experience doing this using Urkel. A little bit about a little bit about me. My name is Kelly, and I am an engineering manager currently working at Formidable. If you've not heard of Formidable before, we are a JavaScript consultancy, and we are very passionate about all things to do with JavaScript, GraphQL, and open source. Urkel, the library I'm going to be talking quite a bit about today, is actually part of Formidable open source. So what are we going to cover today? I'm going to talk about why you might want to use GraphQL with React Native, the challenges I've faced using GraphQL with React Native, and something that I've been asked quite a bit about recently, which is the differences between Urkel and Apollo Client in this context. What this talk isn't about, it's not going to be an introduction to GraphQL. Now, that does, it doesn't mean that you need to be an expert. You don't need to even have shipped everything, anything using GraphQL or even used it, uh, to be fair. If you just know what GraphQL is, what it's used for, and you're kind of familiar with the, uh, with the syntax, um, you'll be able to understand this talk. Why use GraphQL with React Native? Well, for the most part, you might want to use it for the same reasons you might want to use it with React on the web. But I'll cover a couple of more React Native specific reasons. One big thing for me is the smaller payloads. You only request what you need, which is a huge selling point of GraphQL in general. When we're building mobile applications, we need to be especially aware of how much data our applications are consuming. So for React Native, this is especially important. The other thing, and perhaps the main thing for me, is that you get an API contract that's typed. Even if your API engineer uh, shipped the API without any documentation and didn't tell you what any of the queries are called, the schema has to be shipped with the API and the schema is typed. So even if you don't actually have any documentation for the API, using the schema you have a pretty good idea of what can be possible to do with the GraphQL API. Now, when you're using GraphQL with React Native, I will assume that you are using a GraphQL client. Um, I think you, you could, in theory, do it without, but it would be a lot of work. And uh, the last two things I wanted to bring out are actually related to using GraphQL with a client. Uh, one of the main things for me is that you get built-in caching. Now, if you ever worked on a React Native project um, that's using a RESTful API, you'll probably also use Redux to store all your data in your own Redux state. And that's a very good way of doing it, but it's quite verbose and it's quite a lot of boilerplate. And one of the main things that GraphQL, <coughs> using a GraphQL client will give you is that you have built-in caching. Uh, which means you don't need to manage the data on your own. And that's incredibly powerful. I was once part of a project where we actually moved from REST to using GraphQL, and the amount of Redux code we got to delete and replace it with nothing because it was handled in the library was incredibly satisfying. The other thing is around offline support. Now, for mobile applications, offline support is quite important because um, when it comes to websites, your users generally don't expect them to work offline. But when it comes to mobile applications, they get a bit pissed off if they can't uh, use them on the tube. Now, offline support isn't always built into your GraphQL client, but because they already have caching, um, you're kind of halfway there at least. Uh, and that's incredibly important. Now, suppose you're starting a new React Native project with GraphQL and you need to choose a client. At the moment, there are three GraphQL clients to choose from that I'm aware of, and these are Relay, Apollo Client, and Urkel. Relay is the original GraphQL client, I think, and it's built and maintained by Facebook. Apollo Client is the one that we're most aware of, I think. It's the first kind of open source one that came after Relay. And Urkel is the new kid on the block that's um, 
quite recent and it was built to be more extensible and uh, kind of learning from community learnings uh, of the Apollo client. I personally haven't used Relay, I read a documentation, it looks decent, but I have all used Apollo client extensively and Urkel quite a bit, so this talk is going to be focusing on those two. A bit of history of my experience using React Native and GraphQL. My very first React Native project, which was in 2017, we actually used GraphQL on it, and that was using Apollo Client. After that, I've worked on various React Native projects, both with and without GraphQL, and both Greenfield and Brownfield. But so far, those have always been using Apollo Client. Now this all changed early this year when I started a Greenfield project where the client wanted us to use Urkel on a front end. I was incredibly excited to do this because I've, I've heard a lot about Urkel. I've been really keen to actually uh, try it out in anger. Let's talk about Urkel. Urkel is a blazing fast GraphQL client that supports React, Preact and Svelte which is something that I got from the website. From my experience, I can also attest that it um, supports React Native. I asked one of my colleagues, Phil, for, who is an Urkel core maintainer, for a quote about Urkel for this, for this talk. And he said, our place in the ecosystem was to challenge existing solutions and to be flexible enough to adopt new ideas. That's basically the core idea uh, of Urkel. It's to be incredibly flexible and to be extensible and you can opt in and out of each part of the um, of the ecosystem. Now let's get stuck in and look at some code. How to get started. To get started with Urkel we start by adding the library. We add Urkel and GraphQL. Then we create a client using the create client function exported from Urkel. The only mandatory config uh, option for the client is the URL for your GraphQL endpoint. Then we use the provider that's also exported from Urkel and we wrap our application uh, in the provider and pass the client in. This gives everything inside the provider access to the Urkel client. Now on the other side, I also um, added the equivalent documentation for Apollo just so you'll be able to uh, compare and contra contrast them. They're quite similar. You still start by installing the client and GraphQL. But when you create the client, you notice the Apollo client has a new keyword, um, insinuating it's a class, which I guess doesn't matter to the end user anyway, but that's something that's different. And also, you pass in the cache uh, yourself, so that's one of their config options. Now let's look at how we query data. For both Urkel and Apollo, we use the use query hook. Um, I think Apollo actually has various ways you can request data. There's higher order components, there's render props, but um, I'm going to use use query because that's the, that's the coolest way, as we know. <laughs> so to request data, we use the use query hook. <clears throat> On Urkel, we pass in an object and one of the keys for this object is, is query, where we pass in the string with the query string. Now this use query returns an array, where the first item is the response object, which has all the metadata around whether the response is currently fetching, or if it's errored, or if it's returned with the data. The second parameter on there is actually the re-execute re function, so you can re-execute the query. Now, to contrast this with Apollo, it's quite similar, it does the same thing, but the API is slightly different. Namely, you, <clears throat> in order to pass in the function, you have to use the GraphQL tag library to convert it to the GraphQL AST yourself. Whereas in Echo, although it does do that, it does it under the hood, so you don't need to worry about it. The other difference is the return, return uh, syntax. So for Apollo, it returns a object with loading, error, and data, and the re-execute um, function is also part of this object. 
Let's talk about exchanges. Exchanges are a series of operations that transform the input stream to the output stream. If you're going to compare them to anything, they are quite similar to Apollo Link, but they go a bit further than that because they're more of a central concept. In fact, when I asked Yovi, who is uh, also a core maintainer of Urkel for a quote for this presentation, he said that Urkel is so extensible that even the cache is an exchange. Let's look a little bit deeply, more deeply into how exchanges work. Urkel is a stream-based library, so we basically we can imagine the data as a stream, and usually it's likened to a stream of water, in, which is why I've um, depicted all the exchanges as pipes. So between the use query and the data coming back, we have a bunch of pipes or exchanges. And let's look deep, more deeply into the default exchanges that come prepackaged with Urkel. The first one we have is called the ddup exchange. The ddup exchange removes duplicates from pending operations. Now this is very handy if you might re render a React tree and there's two components that have a used query with exactly the same query. This ddup exchange would spot that and remove one of the duplicates because there's no point doing exactly the same request twice. Um, and therefore, both of the use query, com like components using the use query, will be able to uh, consume the same instance of the data. Another exchange that we have is, of course, the cache exchange, which is the default caching logic using document caching. And finally, we have the fetch exchange, which basically takes the operation, sends it to the API using fetch, and adding the results to the output stream. And between here, you could write your own custom enhancements in your own exchange. Now, why might you want to do that? Well, a very um, common example would be an auth exchange. You might want to write an exchange that adds a authentication token, uh, authentication header for each request. This is what I had to do, and I'm going to take you through what it takes to build your own exchange for adding a token to the auth header. Now, in order to create a custom exchange, uh, let's look at an example of a no-op exchange. That is, an exchange that doesn't do anything. Essentially, what we do is we get the stream, stream of operations, and we have the opportunity to update anything we want within these operations. That is, to add things, to remove things, or just add parameters to the operation, and then before passing it through to the next exchange then calling forward with those new operations would be the last thing you do on your exchange. So the first thing I did is look at, I, I looked at an example that already existed, which was how to add an auth exchange to React. Well, in this example, we take the token from local storage and we add, it, add an auth header to each request. So what I did is I basically took this example and made it work with React Native. The difference between React and React Native is that our storage tends to be asynchronous. So whether you use async storage or sensitive info, the request for fetching your data tends to be asynchronous. Thankfully, within the, within the exchanges, we can use asynchronous operations. So I was able to update this map to be asynchronous. Now this did work, but I run into a weird problem. I was using React Navigation, and in combination of this auth exchange and React Navigation, I kept having warnings that said that something was fired with no listeners uh, registered. This is indicative of a memory leak, which was quite concerning. I noticed that this happened whether you used async storage, sensitive info, but it didn't happen if you just used a normal promise, which seemed like it was something to do with those libraries. At this point, I decided to abandon this line of thinking because the idea of doing an asynchronous request for every single um, uh, every single request that goes through my library just felt felt a bit wrong. So I went back to the drawing board. The next thing I tried was fetching a token outside of the client creation and passing it into the ex uh, auth exchange as a variable. Now this does work. But the problem with this solution is that when the token changes, for example, 
when um, the user's token has been invalidated and refetched, the client needs to be created, which means that I'd lose all the cash that was accum accumulated. Finally, this is a code snippet of what I ended up doing eventually. And something that I didn't realize before was that the everything before the return in an exchange is stateful. Basically, what I could do is I could, um, when the auth exchange is initialized, I could start a um, request. Uh, I, I, could, I could start a promise to, for example, fetch the token from the storage. And then I could store it in a state within the exchange. And then within the auth exchange, I could uh, pause the execution of the remaining queries until the token has been fetched. I'm not going to lie, building this auth exchange was definitely the most trickiest part for me for using Urkel. And I've been very keen to find a way to make it easier for, for others. So I've been working on a auth exchange, which hopefully should encompass all the requirements that you might have when building authentication. This includes adding the token to your header, fetching it from storage and the refresh logic. This is quite an ambitious undertaking and I don't know how it's going to turn out. I'm hoping it will be a catch-all solution, but it might end up being a, um, a bunch of code snippets. Uh, check my Twitter after this talk for an update on how the auth exchange is going. Why is caching so important? Caching means that when we query the same piece of data several times with little time apart, we won't have to do an API request each time, just the first time, and on subsequent times we can use the cached data. Caching is also the first step towards offline capabilities. As mentioned previously, Urkel comes with document cache by default. You can set your caching strategy on a query by query basis using the request policy key. The default request policy for all the queries is cache first. And this means that the uh, Urkel will check the cache um, if the query exists in the cache, it, it will get returned. If it doesn't, a network request gets made. The other, caching, uh, the other request policies are cache and network. This means that um, first uh, we'll check the cache if the query exists and if it does, return it immediately, but still do the network request and update the cache um, with the new data. Then we have cache only which only reads from the cache and never does the network request. If the query didn't exist in the cache, you'll just get empty data. And there's network only, which doesn't look at the cache at all, but always does a network request. Now, you might also wonder how we could handle cache invalidation. That is, can we tell the query that, okay, we only care um, like we only want this cache to be valid for a certain amount of time. And you can do that using the Urkel exchange request policy. In this example, the um, requests are valid for one minute. And after that, unless the request policy was said to be cache only, we refetch the query if the next time it's requested. Now let's talk about graph cache. Graph cache, in my opinion, is the best thing about Urkel. It's basically a more sophisticated cache and it's more sophisticated because it handles interdependencies. In order to install graph cache, you just install Urkel exchange graph cache and you add it to the list of your exchanges with a config object. Now to see graph cache in action, um, let's look at how you could handle cache updates after a mutation. Here we have a used query that queries a list of to-dos. And below we have an example of a mutation which will take a mutation, uh, sorry, which will take a particular to-do by ID and update its title. How, what, like after, after, when we've done this query and this mutation, 
how do we update our cache with the new title for this to-do item? Now, the first thing you might think about is refetch queries. If you used a Polo, uh, Polo client before, you're quite familiar about it. It's kind of the quick and easy way to get your cache updated. And basically, it's an array of queries that you want to refetch after mutation has returned. And it's, it basically uh, is, what it, is what it says on a tin. It works. Uh, but it's a little bit inefficient because you might be, in, in, might be doing more network requests that you really need to. And Urco actually doesn't even have refetch queries. All right, how else could we do it? How about we could manually update cache with the mutation results? Well, if you ever used Apollo client, you are definitely going to be familiar with update queries. I've certainly written many, many, many of those. What an update query is, is basically a function that gets run after a mutation is completed and it will give you the mutation result and the cache and it will basically give you the option of using that mutation result to update the cache however it needs to be updated. Now this is incredibly flexible, it works, uh, there's nothing really it can't do but its downside is that it's quite verbose and quite tedious. And it might leave you thinking, well, if the cache is so clever and GraphQL is so typed, um, why can't we just let cache handle it? And with GraphCache, we can. With GraphCache, the cache is automatically updated with the mutation results. Now, I find this so awesome. I actually made a separate slide just for this statement. With GraphCache, the cache is automatically updated with the mutation result. The way it works is that each piece of data has a type name, which comes with from GraphQL anyway, and an ID or a key field. And for example, here, when we have a mutation where we update the to-do, we also query the result, which should be a, a to-do item type, and we query the ID and whatever changed. And GraphCache will basically automatically update the cache based on these two values. The only uh, gotcha here is that you need to remember to always re-query the fields in the mutation that have changed as a result of it. If the data doesn't have a reliable ID, which can happen, you can add it manually in the cache config. Um, so you can, you can basically create a dynamic key if there is a com combination of items from the parents that make up a unique ID for the child. Or if there is no such combination of items, or if it just doesn't make sense for that field, you can opt out of cache updates for these values. Now, what if the mutation result doesn't return everything that gets updated? Well, in that case, you can also define manual update queries if you need to. So all of this logic around update queries, you can pretty much, you can still do exactly that, just most of the time you don't have to. I've got a, an example here, which is similar, but not quite um, what I had to do on my, part, on, my, on my last project. And basically this is, imagine you've got an application which uh, has a bunch of to-do items and you have a query for the current user and the current user query will have a current user's to-do list. So if you have a to-do list in progress, um, you will have a current to-do list item on the current user. And if you, uh, basically, if you update the last item in your to-do list as complete, you want to remove the current to-do list from the current user. And this is something that you can, you can do by extending the cache config. You have an update key where you can, you can add a update query for each mutation if you need to. So this, for example, checks if the completed percentage is one. So if the to-do list is completely complete, <laughs> completely complete, um, and in this case, I will take the update query and remove the current to-do list by replacing it with null. So this is an example of a mutation, like updating something elsewhere in the cache. So again, we didn't have to uh, refetch the current user, which is quite handy. Now, I talked about offline support previously. I won't go very deep in, deeply into it, but um, with uh, Apollo client, there is a library called Apollo Cache Persist, which basically allows you to persist 
the cache of um, of your like Apollo client, and uh, you'll be able to kind of replay your actions on top of it. I've actually done talks about this before. It's uh, it's a little bit uh, fiddly, but it is possible to do. With Urkel with Graph Cache, there is actually offline support. Currently, I think it's in beta, um, but it's something that Urkel intends to support out of the box. So uh, if you're interested in offline support with Urkel, I recommend reading the Graph Cache offline docs on the Urkel documentation site. Let's talk about DevTools. Urkel DevTools have full React Native support, and it's awesome. You can see the network requests, you can inspect the cache, and you can execute, execute queries using the DevTools. In order to add the DevTools, it's obviously an exchange. <laughs> so in order to add it to your project, you add Urkel DevTools, and then you add, it, add the Urkel DevTools exchange um, into your uh, create client. As a side note, you don't need to worry about uh, the DevTools exchange in production because it automatically um, bails out if your node env is production. Then to launch the Urkel DevTools, you just run npx Urkel DevTools in your terminal. And this is what you get. Uh, I won't go very deep in deeply into it, but this is uh, what the Urkel DevTools looks like using an example project that I have which uh, basically lists a bunch of artworks from a public GraphQL API. Now, on the left, you can see all the requests that I've done. So you've got a list of artworks and individual artworks. You can query all the fields. You can see the types of the data. And on the right, you can also see metadata about that request. On the second tab, we have the events. And this is a timeline of all the queries and mutations that you've done with your Urkel, um, Urkel client. And this is quite handy. It kind of, um, it's inspired by the network tab in Chrome, and it basically aims to do the same thing. So you can see how long the requests took, uh, what data was sent and received, and how, and um, yeah, everything in between. And finally, we have kind of a GraphQL playground type thing. And this works quite similarly to GraphQL Playground that you might be used to. The, o the only difference is that because it runs through, it, it's attached to your client, it uses the exchanges that you already built. So for me, for example, I'd already built an auth exchange. So my exchange added the auth header that I needed, which means that I don't need to worry about adding an auth, auth header here which is something that was quite tedious to do using the GraphQL Playground. In summary, using GraphQL with React Native is awesome. I really enjoyed it, and I will definitely be using it again. Apollo Client was the very first GraphQL client that I used, and it's the one I've still used the most. And it's been very reliable and awesome. But I've got to admit, Urkel has won me over, and it's mostly to do with Graph Cache. I love not having to write update queries and have the mutations up, like get updating the cache automatically. I also love the fast issue resolution, thanks to Phil and Yobi being completely on it when it comes to issues. And also, I love the extensibility first approach. Thank you so much for tuning in. Here's a collection of links related to what I discussed throughout the presentation. If you want to catch up around anything in this presentation or just about Urkel, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. Urkel, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter.